I am Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist and I live and work here in London. I assess mentally disordered offenders so you don't have to. So I absolutely had to do this episode on Jeremy Bamber. Uh, it's a really gruesome case and a few people have reached out to me on social media plus I got a specific request from Fiona, the promoter of this podcast. I have to admit I hadn't heard about this particular case until Kay from White House Farm podcast reached out to me. So she is doing a series on this uh, horrific murder that's a lot more detailed than mine, so you should check it out. The links will be in the description below. However, I thought I'd go from a different angle because my area of expertise is forensic psychiatry, which is the crossover of mental illness and offending. So I've picked a specific angle related to this. This is without question one of the most gruesome and cold-blooded murders that I've ever heard of. So Jeremy Bamber murdered five members of his own family in cold blood. Then he tried to frame it on his sister who has paranoid schizophrenia, or I should say had, because she was one of the victims. She was murdered at the age of 28 and the two six-year-old twin boys were also killed. So this all happened in Essex in the UK. So foreign friends, Essex is a county northeast of London where the women have a reputation of being very friendly. So I'm going to answer the questions in these episodes, including how realistic was it for Jeremy Bamber to try and frame his sister? And why did Jeremy Bamber fail? Before we do all of that, I am first gonna welcome you to the channel. Welcome to A Psych for Sore Minds. Have you got an interest in true crime? What about mental illness? Well, why not both? A Psych for Sore Minds is the only YouTube channel that I'm aware of that addresses the crossroads of the two. And I am your host, Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant, forensic psychiatrist. I spend my life assessing and rehabilitating mentally disordered offenders in prisons and in courts and in secure psychiatric units. I also act as an expert witness and I advise judges in criminal courts during trials across the UK. So this channel here dissects a whole range of mental health topics. Some are related to violence and offending and some are not. They're kind of more familiar to the average person, including interviewing a number of ex-patients, people who have suffered from mental illness. So basically what I'm saying is there's something for everyone on this channel. So let's get back to the Jeremy Bamber murders. So a bit of background about this case. So on the 7th of August, 1985, Jeremy Bamber, who lived on a farm with his family, apparently receives a, a panicked phone call from his father saying that Sheila, his sister, has gone crazy and had one of the guns and they were all in danger. Now, a bit oddly, Bamber, instead of calling the police, he actually calls a local radio station who then called the police although the police eventually meet him at the farm. Outside the farm, Bamba tells the police that his sister has paranoid schizophrenia and she has access to a loaded gun. So his sister, Sheila, apparently had religious delusions and had two previous admissions to a mental health unit. And it's reported that the Bambas were a very religious family and they had a very strict upbringing. And their mother apparently was particularly overbearing and Sheila reportedly had specific delusions focused on her young sons. So she believed that one of them wanted to have sex with her and the other one was a serial killer. And she was taking antipsychotic medication. She was taking a depot injection of 100 milligrams of haloperidol. And her dosage was recently decreased from 200 milligrams. And I actually think that's relevant, but I'll come to that later. The reason it was decreased was because she'd been suffering from different side effects, including feeling lethargic. Sheila was also prescribed clomipramine, which is an old style antidepressant, although she didn't actually have any traces of this in her blood on autopsy, which suggests that she hadn't been taking the antidepressant recently. Sheila was also found with small amounts of cannabis in her urine, although Bamba stated that they had smoked it together a few days earlier in a party. So the officers broke in after a few hours after a bit of a standoff and the worst case scenario that they can imagine actually happened they found five dead bodies. And it seemed that the family had been shot 25 times in a murder-suicide and a gun is found on Sheila's body. So the police initially accept Bamba's version of events that Sheila went postal. But within a few days, a number of close friends 
and the family called the police and they're, they're kind of suspicious of Bamba's behaviour. He's just acting oddly, he seems really pleased that he's just inherited almost half a million pounds. Eventually, Bamba's girlfriend contacts the police and says that not only had he killed his family, but he'd been planning this for months. A year later, Bamba is found guilty on five counts of murder and he's sentenced to 25 years in prison. A decade later, this is converted to a life sentence and Bamba is in prison to this day and he protests his innocence to this day. So let's look at the first question. How realistic was it for Bamba to frame his sister? I am, of course, working on the assumption that the courts were correct and that Bamba was actually completely guilty and that Sheila was an innocent victim who tragically got murdered along with the two children and her parents. So I'm basically saying the opposite of what Bamba is protesting. Although I should say that a lot of people believe him and he actually has a lot of supporters. So I'm speaking hypothetically whether it's plausible for police to believe that Sheila committed these murders. I'm not for a second suggesting that I think she did. So I am a forensic psychiatrist. I assess and treat people who have schizophrenia. It's probably my, the, co the most common diagnosis that I see. And they've committed a whole range of offenses, some of them violent, occasionally murder. It is rare, but I do see it. Now, there are lots of YouTube series and podcasts out there with opinions but I have an expert perspective. And in some of my other episodes on my channel, I talk about real life cases of people that I've assessed, although I anonymize those people out of respect for them and also for the victims of their crimes. So just to be really crystal clear, most people who are mentally ill are not dangerous. Most people who are mentally ill are more likely to be victims, actually. And most people who commit serious crimes do not have a severe mental illness. However, there is a small subsection where they kind of overlap and that breeds the subspecialty of forensic psychiatry. That keeps me in a job, it pays my bills, and it pays to make this channel. But anyway, let's not get distracted. Let's look back at Sheila Bamba. So we know she had paranoid schizophrenia. One day I'll do a, a Psych for Sore Minds episode on that diagnosis, but just very briefly, typically it includes hearing voices and paranoid delusions. So obviously schizophrenia has a, a range of severity. So on one end of the spectrum, you have people who will never recover and who spend all of their lives in hospital. Obviously this is very tragic seen it a few times, I've seen it in Broadmoor Hospital especially. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have people with schizophrenia who function very well in the community. They're stable on their medications, they need very little input from psychiatrists, and most people are in between those two extremes. Obviously, that's how spectrums work. So, from the limited information that I have, it seems that Sheila had two missions to psychiatric hospital and one was only months before the murders. Now, usually there's quite a high threshold to need to go to a hospital in the first place. So that suggests that her illness was severe. Another massive potential factor is her recent decrease in medication. So it's quite common for psychiatrists to decrease patients' medication because of side effects. And to be honest, it's trial and error to a degree. So it's impossible to predict which person will suffer from which side effects with different medications, which ones they will find more intolerable. So usually decreases of doses are done very slowly and it's kind of a balancing act. So it's a balance of how much the patient is suffering with side effects versus the emergence of symptoms and the overall risk. And after decreasing a medication, it's fairly common for people to have what we call breakthrough symptoms. So their psychosis gets worse and their delusions get more intense. And this usually happens within a couple of weeks of a medication change. So actually, when you think about it, it's ideal timing for Jeremy Bamba to frame his sister, Sheila. Also, Sheila had traces of cannabis in her urine and cannabis is safe for the vast majority of people, but it's also renowned for causing relapse in some people with psychotic illnesses, such as schizophrenia, who are susceptible. So Jeremy said that he smoked a joint with his sister a couple of days uh, before the murders, murders, although he could have actually kept his mouth shut. And then for all the investigators knew, she could have had large amounts of cannabis earlier with only traces left by the time she was tested. So large amounts of cannabis is, uh, suggests is an indicator of more likely relapse. Another very relevant factor, in my view, is the content of Sheila's delusions. 
So some delusions are potentially dangerous. As a forensic psychiatrist, I have to bear this in mind when I carry out a risk assessment on any new patient. So two quick examples for cases that I've personally been involved in in the last couple of months. So I saw a pregnant woman with schizophrenia who believed that her neighbor was a paedophile and that he'd been drugging her at night and raping the fetus inside of her. So she actually attacked him with a broom. So in this case, there's a clear and easily accessible target. That very same week, I also assessed a man with schizoaffective disorder and he believed that there were like cameras planted around that were watching him and that's actually a very common type of delusion it's a very common theme that i see in my patients either being watched or being followed or being spied upon i've heard that reported by hundreds of patients and most often with these patients they are bothered by this they are disturbed but there's no clear target so they might get agitated they might act out in this particular case, this man started taking apart equipment like kettles and microwaves because he was looking for the cameras, but he didn't attack anybody because there was no clear target. So Sheila's reported delusions were about her six-year-old sons. She believed that one of them wanted to have sex with her and one of them was a serial killer. So obviously the, these are delusions where she could uh, act out she could attack them, they are vulnerable, they're very excessive, she might feasibly retaliate. So although the whole case and the risk assessment is multifactorial and complex, the one biggest factor would be the history of previous violence. So if Sheila had previously committed serious violence, this would massively increase the risk of it happening again. Although very occasionally I see patients who present with violence as their first presentation is it's unusual it usually escalates over time obviously another huge factor that's specific to this case is having access to a loaded gun so that is extremely dangerous for anybody with a mental illness i do actually have some thoughts about gun control in america but I'm not really in the mood for a barrage of abuse. Thanks, I think I'll pass. Everything I do have to say on this topic can be summed up by the clip in the description box below by a stand-up comedian called Jim Jeffries, who I love, seen him live recently. Check him out in the link below. So let's take this whole picture and let's look at it holistically. I think Jeremy Bamber had the exact perfect conditions to frame his sister. And if he was clever enough, he could have even ramped up suspicions further. He could have done this by claiming that Sheila was slowly deteriorating in the few weeks before. He could have stated that she was acting in an odd manner, she was being paranoid, because this is how it usually happens. It's a gradual deterioration. But as far as I'm aware, he didn't think to do that. Incidentally, if Sheila had committed a murder, and if her actions were directly related to her delusional beliefs, then there's a possibility that she might have been given a disposal of diminished responsibility, which downgrades murder to manslaughter. This is exactly the kind of thing that I give evidence about in court, and I will do a separate episode from the Site for Small Minds about diminished responsibility one day in the future. So let's ask the next question. Why didn't Bamba get away with it? So why didn't Bamba get away with it? Well, I think Bamba actually messed up in his actions afterwards. He told his girlfriends of his plans. He wasn't acting in an appropriately sad manner to be grieving for somebody who's had five family members murdered. And also there were several holes in his evidence. So for example, his father supposedly called him after he'd been shot, but there was no blood on the phone. And also Sheila, who had committed suicide apparently, shot herself twice in the head during the suicide. I don't know if you've ever shot yourself in the head, but doing it twice is very impractical, trust me. So had Bamba not made some rookie mistakes when it came to fabricating the evidence, then he might have literally gotten away with murder, making this story even more tragic than it already is. So, dear viewers, what do you think? Do you agree with, uh, with what I've said? I'm sure some of you watching this are real true crime enthusiasts, probably more than I am. So have I missed anything important from this case? Please do tell me, are there any other factors which would have made it easier or harder to, sh to frame Sheila? Don't be shy, let me know in the comments section below. So I'm going to tell you about what's going on in the next few episodes of A Sight for Sore Minds. But before that, I just have to share this news with you, okay? I'm going to be a speaker at CrimeCon UK in June 2021. That's if the whole world is still alive by then. 
So if you don't know, CrimeCon is a massive convention. It's huge in the States and it's coming over to the UK for the first time ever. There'll be lots of speakers from law enforcement officers to reporters. There'll be your favorite podcasters, YouTubers and bloggers. And I'll be doing a talk about two real life heartbreaking cases of patients that I personally assess. Both have killed their own family members. Both had mental illnesses. One was criminally responsible for the murder and one wasn't. That's why I chose them. So coming soon on this channel, I'm going to do an episode on the difference between narcissism and psychopathy. And I'm also going to do a series about gangs and offending. And this is gonna include three real life cases I've assessed. One was a, a gang related murder of a teenager by a teenager. One was a target of a local gang and um, the pressures of this made him mentally unwell. And another case, I'm pretty sure that a gang exploited a vulnerable man, getting him to do their dirty work, and he ended up in prison on a pretty serious um, arms, possession of arms charge. If you're a fan of pressing buttons, I've got some great news for you right now. Right? If you subscribe to our channel on YouTube, not only will it help me out immeasurably, but it will actually bring back those little plastic toys you know, the ones you used to get in cereal boxes? You remember that, you remember the good old days, right? So please do hit subscribe. Comment more on the videos, please. If you, uh, Some people have reached out recently on the YouTube comments and I've had a bit of a chat, it's been lovely. Uh, so please get involved. Follow us on Instagram, like our Facebook page, uh, follow us on Twitter. And if you have an episode idea or any questions for me, email me please on a site for sore minds at gmail.com. And if you're gonna reference us, use the hashtag Psych Saw. Finally, tell your favorite people about Psych for Saw Minds, please. They deserve it. Spread the love. Until next time. Stay euthymic, and I just want you to know, sincerely, I love you.